we have what is called a sovereignty movement. But that movement is predicated on presuming that Hawaii is a part of the United States and they're seeking to break away, seeking independence. That got people to do some due diligence. Lo and behold, we found out that Hawaii had already achieved its sovereignty. So there's really no need for a sovereignty movement. Hawaii actually achieved the recognition of itself as a sovereign state in 1843 by joint proclamation from Great Britain and France and by the United States by Secretary of State John C. Calhoun in 1844. In fact, Hawaii was the first non-European nation to be explicitly recognized as an independent and sovereign state. And by 1893, Hawaii had over 90 embassies and consulates all over the world. In fact, the Hawaiian Kingdom had a consulate in New York, an embassy in Washington, D.C., and the United States had an embassy in Honolulu, as well as consulates throughout the islands. Textbooks, however, tell a different story. Tell us about what kids have been learning the past hundreds of years. Well, back in 1898, the United States was experiencing a jolt of expansionism, imperialism. They were acquiring territories during the Spanish-American War from Spain, but it was acquired by treaty. They acquired territories from Mexico that was acquired by Treaty of Conquest, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Pacific Northwest from Great Britain. In each of these cases, you have treaties. For Hawaii, there was no treaty. In fact, there were two failed attempts to annex Hawaii by treaty, but our queen, Queen Liliuokalani, and Hawaiian nationals were um, activated and filed protests with the State Department and the U.S. Senate, which effectively killed the treaty. Now, when the Spanish-American War broke out in 1898, in April, the United States military occupied Guam and the Philippines, which were Spanish colonies. And it was as a result of that, Hawaii was seized, according to the United States Congress, as a war measure, where they passed an internal law called a Joint Resolution of Annexation, an internal law which has no extraterritorial effect, but they annexed Hawaii, and it was through that law it was disguised as if it was a treaty. So history books actually reflect a treaty of annexation when it was actually congressional legislation that is limited to U.S. territory. More simple terms, so that I can make sure I'm understanding you correctly. It wasn't Hawaii's willfully joining the United States. It was taken over. It was actually occupied. Occupied. Militarily. So what are you doing today in terms of Hawaii's state sovereignty? It's education. It's exposure. I currently sit on three doctoral committees at the University of Hawaii. My doctoral dissertation centers on this topic, which is titled The American Occupation of Hawaii, Beginning the Transition from Occupied to Restored State. In fact, I had the privilege of representing Hawaii in the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. Uh, this was back in the year 2000. And people know who understand the Permanent Court of Arbitration as a world court, only states can enter that court, not sovereignty movements only state. So we were able to access that court because of the continuity of Hawaii as a state, not the proclamation of Hawaii as a state. And it was through that, that arbitration proceedings that Dr. Biho Zagawa, His Excellency, an ambassador from Rwanda who was assigned to Brussels, Belgium, had contacted me and my legal team to meet with him after he had retrieved the information from the court. And he asked if we could meet him in Brussels, Belgium. And there we were picked up by the motorcade from Rwanda and taken to a meeting of the African Union and went in to meet the ambassador. He greeted us and took us across the street for a short meeting in a little cafe in Belgium. And it was closed down just for us. And that is where he told us that his government had reviewed all the information and it was clear Hawaii's occupied. And that he said something that resonated. He said he understands what happens when international law is violated, but the international community does not step in until it's too late. He was making specific reference to the massacre, the Hutus and the Tutsis. And he said it felt, he felt that his government, it was their responsibility to bring this to the attention of the General Assembly. Now, that was an unbelievable opportunity back in the year 2000, but we couldn't accept it. We thanked the ambassador, conveyed our sincere gratitude to the president, but we said we have to go home and begin re-education. And it was January of 2001, the very next month, that I entered the University of Hawaii and entered the political science department to specialize in international relations and then ultimately get that PhD to provide a solution, a solution to this problem because the ramifications are profound, economic, legal, political, military, environmental, you name it, we got it. When this information first came out back in the year 2000, shock, you're basically telling people that what you thought was, wasn't, it was a lie. And people take it hard. Like for myself, I'm a retired captain, fit artillery. So I'm an army officer, former army officer. It was hard for me. I could not grapple with this idea that, you mean Hawaii's occupied? I couldn't fathom that. But it was through the information and education that I began to understand, well, that's history. And I can't change it. 
And the best thing we can do is before we make any decision, we need to understand what's going on. Just as in business, due diligence is so important before you invest on anything. <laughs> yeah? So before people invest, they need to understand. Uh, one thing that I've learned in the military, and I take this with me in my, in my academic realm, as well as out in the community and at the United Nations, the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. That film never changes, but our projector has to get updated. Once we update that projector, we will see the future. So I concentrate on the film and the projector to be updated because the answers are all there. We just need to understand what went on and not judge. Today, the culprits are gone. The criminals are gone. We are all victims of, victims of circumstance. It implores us to, to really take responsibility and say, don't say what happened. A lot of times you might have to understand why did it happen? Because it's good to know both sides, yeah? and, and that's the key. So that's what I do when I teach at the University of Hawaii. And I've also been able to share this information with members of, of the United Nations. And you've got to talk about updated versions. You've got a DVD. Can you look, tell us a little bit about that? Well, we actually have a DVD of the Larson case mm -hmm. yeah, that I've been delivering to a few ambassadors. And basically it comes with a, a DVD itself and a book. Okay. But what's also interesting is the person who was one of the arbitrators, Professor James Crawford, He's a member of the International Law Commission back in the year 2000, and he was also the special rapporteur for Articles of State Responsibility for International Wrongful Acts, which is the Achilles heel of, inf of international law, which is enforcement. They understood what that case was about, and this case was monumental because it was Hawaii's re-entry re -entry into the international realm. In fact, Hawaii had 46 treaty partners, 46. One of them was Persia. Yeah? It included, well, today it's Iran. Today it's Germany, France, Great Britain. So 46 treaty partners. Some of those treaty partners of Hawaii decolonized territories. You have now successor states. Now, successors are not only successors of the predecessor, they're also successors to the predecessor's treaties with other parties, including the Hawaiian Kingdom. So Hawaii, through this history and understanding, we have went from 46 treaty partners, direct treaty partners, to 173 treaty partners. There's only 193 members of the United Nations. <laughs> How does this impact relations with neighboring countries, for example, and the economy? Well, there's one thing that Hawaii suffers by, and I say suffers in a sense of economics. The United States passed the congressional law called the Jones Act. Okay, the Jones Act requires foreign goods to enter designated ports on the coast of the United States, and distribution of those goods will be done by American flagships. So for Hawaii, we live 2,400 miles in the middle of the Pacific, separate from the west coast of California. Our ships, our containers, Matson, okay, travel to the port of Los Angeles empty, reload, and come all the way back to distribute. Now, according to these treaties and the successor ships, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, they can now come directly into Hawaiian ports on their way to the port of Los Angeles. Now, that would greatly affect our cost of living. They could be exercising direct treaty relations, you know, commercial trade, through the successor treaties. The door opens. Um, at the university, people are now venturing into the, the economic aspect. Oh, so what next? But you don't know what next until you know what happened, and that's where you capitalize on these treaties. And in terms of the future of Hawaii, when it comes to industry, when it comes to neighboring relations, just what's the direction that you're seeing in terms of where, whether it's the business or, of course, uh, the you know, national policy? Well, I do understand if we are going to do any trade in the future, we can only trade surplus. Okay? That means everything, everything stays in Hawaii. We have to be sustainable ourselves before we can share what we have. We're not doing that. We are very dependent. The United States, as far as consuming, very dependent. The laws do not necessarily provide us the ability to be self-sustaining. That is a move that we're going to be looking at. In fact, I got a call from some businessmen two weeks before I came here. In fact, just prior to this week, I was in the Harvard University presenting this history of Hawaii as a sovereign state, as well as University of Massachusetts at Boston, and then the Smithsonian. So I, I came up here. Now, before I left on that tour, I received a call from a few businessmen, investors from East Coast and Houston, who want to invest in real estate and hotels in Hawaii. And they heard about my work. They want to retain me as a consultant to assist in the transition because we need investments, but it has to be under our laws. One thing that will catch them and intrigue them is the fact that low overhead because the tax base, 
always a small country, small taxes, 35% to, uh, taxes today just on individual. In Hawaii, under Hawaiian law, 2%. Uh, that means you keep 98 cents, more money to spend in the economy. So these are the kind of things that are being developed. And also, Hawaii looks like a prime place to invest. But trust me, we're going to make sure that those investments abide by our rules and our laws and what is best for the country, Hawaii. Good luck in your work. Mahalo. Hey, Mayiki.